Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome to you this session for the session this morning with the Real Oxford Farming Conference. Um, it's all the trappings for success. How do we control horticultural pests within horticulture? My name is Carolyn Cox. I'm a horticultural advisor for the Soil Association. I'll be chairing today's session. Just um, a couple of basic housekeeping rules. Um, this session is being recorded. I think we've automatically muted um, all, all attendees this morning, so you should only be able to see um, and hear from our speakers um, on the panel. Um, if, um, if you aren't for some reason muted and your video is, is, is on, please um, turn it off. And then there will be an opportunity to do Q&As um, throughout the session and towards the end um, so um, if you'd like to raise your hand towards the end of the session um, and ask the question in person, then that would be great. Um, and uh, you'll have your microphone on and video on for that, but otherwise um, you'll remain muted. Um, and also, all, if we can put any questions, any Q&As um, through Mentimeter, the link for that is in the chat. Um, and there'll be a few questions through Mentimeter. So if you could log on to that and use the code, um, that would also be great, just means it's easier for us to monitor the chats and any Q&As that's coming through there. Also, you can take the opportunity to introduce yourselves through the chat function on Zoom. Um, I think there's quite a few of us here today. There's about 51 of us, um, or 51 attendees. So it's also a good opportunity to sort of introduce yourself so we get a feel for people that are in the room. Um, because the panel and myself can't actually see um, at the moment whilst we're presenting. So I'd also like to take this opportunity to... Um, thank fab farmers um, for supporting this session fab farmers if you haven't heard of it is an eu project which is focused on supporting farmers in the transition to more ecological practices so this session is predominantly focused on um, pesticide the pesticide reduction through monitoring to enable a more integrated and targeted approach so without um further ado I'd like to introduce the panel briefly this morning we've got Dr Rosemary Collier with us from the Warwick Crop Centre which is part of the School of Life Sciences. Rosemary is an entomologist and does a raft of work through her career on uh, pest identification um, and pest forecasting. We've got James Rome and the agronomist for East of Scotland growers, um, predominantly brassica growers, um, conventional and organic in um, the east of Scotland. And we've got Tim Blythe with us from Soil Moisture Sense and Trap View. So Soil Moisture Sense provide um, equipment and forecasting for soil moisture monitoring, weather stations, and also um, the Trap View equipment for remote monitoring. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Rosemary and um, for her to take the floor. Great, thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, and really sorry that we can't uh, meet in person today. Um, so what I'm gonna do is give a brief introduction to the, the topic. So talk about pest monitoring. Dom, could we have the next slide, please? Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I'm really looking forward to having some discussion with you all. Um, about trapping, about monitoring, forecasting, and the word success is there. So how successful do you think it is at the moment in terms of informing pest management and how successful or how much more successful could we make it in the future? So next slide, please, Don. So pest monitoring, pest forecasting are considered to be essential components of integrated pest management, IPM. Um, you can see here one example of the so-called IPM pyramid, and you can see that they are an integral part um, of pest detection, if you like. And that information just tells you, us, more about what's going on in your crops and also enables you to make better decisions about whether you need to apply any control methods. And if you do, then when those control methods will be most effective. And those control methods may not just be pesticides, maybe biological control, timing of biological control is critical, or maybe other 
methods of control, sort of physical control, uh, other approaches. Next slide, please, Dom. So I guess we're mainly talking about insects, although obviously there are other pests, including slugs, uh, and just some examples here of the types of traps uh, that we use to monitor insects. And the traps capture the insects using different sort of different approaches. Um, so colored traps, colored water traps or sticky traps, which use insect vision, if you like, the insects are attracted to particular colors. Um, then pheromone traps in the middle there, uh, which attract insects via, via smell, via um, the chemicals that insects use to communicate between themselves. And then on the right hand side, um, a, a trap, the one of the suction traps that are part of the Rothamsted Insect Survey, uh, where the insects are actually sucked in. Um, that large tower is effectively a, a tall vacuum cleaner um, that sucks in anything that's flying past and it's got a mesh on it to stop us catching birds. Next slide, please, Dom. We're talking today about, about trapping mainly, but I think it's important to include forecasting systems as well. And within the world, there are a whole variety of forecasting systems for different pests. In the UK, uh, specifically the ones that are, are used or, or available mainly um, are the forecasts produced by the Rothamsted Insect Survey uh, for a number of species of aphid, and then the forecasts for um, vegetable pests that are available through the AHDB uh, pest bulletin um, that is produced from, from Warwick. Next slide, please, Dom. So in terms of, of sources of monitoring information and forecasting information that are available in the UK, then obviously it's perfectly possible to, to monitor insects yourselves on farm and a range of traps for a range of pests are available uh, commercially. Um, there has been up to now um, a lot of information available to growers through the AHDB Pest Bulletin. Um, that includes um, a couple of information for a couple of trapping networks um, that we've run in the last few years. So a network for diamondback moth and a network for Swede midge in which growers have taken part. Uh, there's information on, on aphids, the important pest aphids of crops through the, the Rothamsted Insect Survey bulletins. Um, FERA have, with support from AHDB, uh, run a, a yellow water trap network um, for aphids in potato. And in the last couple of years, we've been using information from that on other species of aphids um, and making that available um, to pest bulletin users. And then in terms of forecasts, um, these um, have been available through the pest bulletin uh, and also there are the aphid forecasts from the insect survey that I mentioned. And I've just coloured a few of these in red um, because up to now those in red have been funded um, through the AHDB, AHDB horticulture and of course as a result of the, um, the AHDB vote uh, earlier in the year, um, that funding is now um, winding down. Um, so the future of, of some of those services um, is a bit uncertain at the moment. Um, I am aware that Ferra are um, going to turn their yellow water trap network into a, a commercial um, service, but, but the future of the other services is uncertain at the moment. Next slide, please. So I guess those networks at the moment are relying on the tools that, that we already have available to us, um, but obviously technology is moving on. Um, and at the moment, I'm currently involved in a European thematic network called Smart Protect, um, and that's coordinated by an agro in Belgium. And what we're doing is identifying commercially available smart IPM solutions for vegetable farmers and advisors. Um, so basically we're looking at smart approaches to IPM in vegetable crops. And I thought I'd just mention a couple of the, uh, 
the smart trapping approaches. So next slide, please, Dom. So there are a number of, of smart approaches to um, insect trapping using pheromone traps or colored sticky traps. Uh, there are a couple of examples here um, shown um, in the fields belonging to our Belgian partners. And Tim is going to talk in a little while um, about one of these tools. Um, so um, traps that are made by, by TrapView. And then next slide, please. Dom. And apart from, if you like, making trapping smarter, um, then there is at least one other novel approach. And this is being developed by a company called Fauna Photonics, uh, a Danish company. And basically they are um, looking at a way of sort of uh, shining a beam of light uh, across a field or a hedgerow or whatever. And any light insect that flies through that um, light is detected um, and the idea is that they can actually identify um, which species of insect that is by its wing beat frequency, colour and, and its size as well. Um, so that's a really interesting technique, um, involves no, no killing insects or, or trapping at all um, and might be a, a really accurate way of identifying species. Um, still under development. So next slide, please, Dom. So but I'm going to stop here now um, and just say thank you to uh, the team here and all the, the funders and supporters. And um, I'm very willing to uh, answer any questions you may have or, or to start the discussion. We haven't had any um, questions so far, um, Rosemary, that have come up in the uh, Q and A. I think there's there's one here, but one in the chat. chat yeah. And um, um, we've been asked, what about prevention? Great talk at last year's conference on how nitrogen fertilisers make make crops more attractive to aphids. Yeah. Um, so no, great. I mean, great point. Uh, today, I guess we're focusing on on trapping and monitoring, um, but prevention is is and will be increasingly um, a key part of of how we need to manage our pests. And um, if we were to go back to the IPM pyramid at the beginning, then then prevention, if you like, is at the bottom of the pyramid um, and should be the basis of all IPM strategies. So, so that is what you should first plan to do, is to use any techniques available um, to prevent insects colonizing your, your crop. Perfect, um, thanks Rosemary. And um, there are some questions just so we can get a feel for people in the room, of who's in the room. There's, um, I think there's, four or five questions on Mentimeter. So if we can share, um, if we click on the link that's in the chat for Mentimeter and, um, and there's, a, there's a link there that'll take you straight through to the page and there's some, vote, there's some questions that you can vote on, which would be great. I think you've posted that, um, that link in the chat, haven't you, Don? I don't know if people can see that. Dom, can you? Uh... Yeah, I posted the link in the chat now. Okay, brilliant. That's great. How many veg growers are using some form of forecasting and how more could be encouraged to do this? Are you also assessing effectiveness in terms of insecticide reduction from better forecasting, timing and decision making? Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Um, there, in fact, A AHDB um, ran a survey, um, which was probably a couple of years now, um, about, about the use of all their um, sort of monitoring and forecasting services. I think it was, it was wider than, than horticulture. Um, and um, I can't remember the precise numbers. I'll look them up in a little while and, and I can feed back in the, in the chats probably. Um, but a reasonable proportion of the respondents, obviously, 
you're depending on people responding to the survey, um, used uh, the system. In fact, consultants and advisors, um, a greater proportion of those use the systems uh, than growers themselves, which I guess I guess makes makes sense. Um, I guess in terms of encouraging more people to um, do this, then they have to be, um, I guess, readily available, easy to use, and and we have to, I guess, be able to demonstrate uh, to users that they they are um, effective and do actually make a difference um so i'd be great you know interesting to hear what people think about how how more people could be encouraged to do this um and it may come up in the other presentations um and in in terms of assessing the effectiveness in terms of insecticide a reduction um from better forecasting timing and decision making um that is quite a tricky thing to do um and, and I think probably the most effective way to do that would be on a, an individual farm basis um, and to get people to sort of look through their records and pesticide usage. I've tried over time to look at the, um, the insecticide, the pesticide usage survey um, report uh, to look at changes in pesticide usage. But overall, um, although the active ingredients used have sort of changed um i don't think overall usage has has declined significantly at at this point again comments welcome brilliant thanks rosemary and um, dan if we go on to the next question on mentimeter so we're just wanting to get a feel for um if you're a farmer and grower listening to uh listening to this what what sort of crop sector are you working in because we're aware that there's obviously various different um the monitoring um systems that are used sometimes more prevalently as they protected cropping than potentially in field in uh, outdoor field production so we've got a bit of a mix which is great So it's just are we, is anybody in the room currently using any um, any pest forecasts at all? The ones that Rosemary mentioned earlier on in the presentation or others? Okay, and uh, next question, please. So this is a word cloud. So if you could just type in which, um, if you are, um, if you are, if you have got any pest traps, what, what what are you currently monitoring? Whether that be sweet midge, aphids on sticky traps, um, the pheromone traps, the diamond back moth, anything like that. So we can see that it looks like aphids are probably one of the most monitored um, monitored pests on farms. Grasshoppers is interesting. Yes. Lily beetle, brilliant. One of my favourite insects because it's bright red. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, perfect. Um, that's great. Thank you very much for those that um, answered those questions. So if there's, oh, there's still more coming, which is good. Um, we can download the answers to these questions um, just to, uh, for reference later on. So if we move on to uh, the next speaker, which would be Jay. Oh, sorry, I missed one. <laughs> If um, what questions would be interest? What, what what insects would you be interested in trapping that you currently aren't? So I think this is the last question. Okay, that's um, that's great. There's some brilliant answers in that. So thank you very much for everybody that um, mm. took part. If we um, if we move on, oh no, there's another one. <laughs> so where do you get your um, pest activity information from currently? Whether that be, as I say, what there are some of the forecasts that Rosemary has mentioned, or um, any others. Again, this is a word cloud, so if you can just type those in, that would be great. You got a mention there, Rosemary. That's good. Hooray. Interesting, failed, failed crops. Yes. Might apply to cabbage stem flea beetle if we were talking about oil save, oil save rope. Mm. We've had a question here, Rosemary, about um, we've got a participant that's based in Germany and they were interested to know if um, know, know if you knew of any pest forecast platforms internationally or maybe in Germany or Europe. Um, um, yes, yes, there are. Um, there are. I know there are some in in Germany, my my colleagues in Germany. Um, obviously, it depends which pest you're interested in. Um, there are definitely um, some pest forecasts that are sort of publicly available uh, from Norway. Um, so it, it is sort of, yeah, what your what your focus is. Um, there is an EU project at the moment. I can't remember its precise name. Again, I'll find that, which is one of the things it's looking at is to try and uh, facilitate the availability of, of forecasting systems uh, throughout Europe, um, because they do tend to be sort of stuck in certain countries at the moment. Okay, great, thank you. And there's a question here on parameters used in the forecasting um, and what, what those parameters are, but I'm, not quite sure if I understand that question. Um, if who who asked that question, if they can just come back and elaborate on that. 
that would be great and we'll pick it up um, later on. Um, uh, great, so that, that, was it. that was the final question. Um, so if we can move on to the next speaker, I'll um, let James take the floor. Good morning, everyone. Um, Happy New Year to you all. And as Rosemary said, shame we aren't able to meet up in person, but there we go. It's the next best thing. So I'm going to just really uh, run through our experience up here in Scotland, um, what we what we do and, and it's really uh, uh, when it comes to pests, what, what we try to do and, and which might answer some of the questions that uh, were mentioned earlier on as well. So I'm the agronomist for East of Scotland Growers. Um, Dom, if you could go to the next slide, please, that'd be great. Um, uh, yeah, I'm the agronomist up here for East of Scotland Growers. It's a farmer-owned cooperative um, of 16 uh, growers. We are predominantly uh, brassicas, um, of which the majority of that is broccoli and cauliflower, but it also includes uh, cabbage, kale. Um, we also do onions and asparagus as, as well up here. Um, so my role is really just the, the ESG as a, as a group. We do all the um, uh, organizing, management, uh, logistics, ordering, that sort of thing. And the growers uh, are in charge of getting, um, once the plants arrive on farm, getting them planted uh, through to harvest, and I'm in the I'm in the middle trying to to keep everything alive. Uh, so we we cover a pretty big geographic area, which adds to sort of some of the complication. We run from sort of Kelso in the borders right up to uh, the east coast um, to just below Aberdeen, um, and we uh, go west in, into into uh, sort of Perthshire as well. Um, so we are predominantly conventional, uh, but we do have a reasonable area of organics as well. Um, and there's uh, something that we have sort of focused on in the last uh, two or three years and uh, have been able to take quite a few trans sort of methods over from one, one to the other. Um, so, uh, Don, next slide, please. Um, I suppose just like my, most other parts of the UK, you know, our, our, our pests are going to be fairly similar. We obviously have uh, the geographic uh, sort of advantage that we we don't touch wood and at least have, uh, tend to get the same pressures uh, for as long uh, through the season. Um, that said, every year is different and, and we, we obviously do. So, you know, as the pictures might suggest, we uh, our main issue, to be honest, is diamondback moth, which uh, we've been lucky last year or two, although we've had big influxes and seen a lot of adults come in from the continent, we haven't um, had a big issue with, with the... Uh, sort of egg laying and larvae and, and damage, therefore. Um, and cabbage root fly, again, is our, our sort of biggest, uh, biggest issue. We are having an increasing amount of uh, issues with sweet midge, um, which we noticed really for the first time about three or four years ago. Um, and that, that's a growing concern. Um, and although again, last year, we weren't quite as badly as affected as, as previous years, um, it, is, it is a growing issue uh, for us. Um, aphids aren't too bad um, for, for us. Um, obviously there's a lot of seed potatoes uh, and, and things grown up in this part of the world. So aphids can be an issue, we're the main ones for us are the mealy aphids. Um, we and then, as I say, we're we're not we're not um, they're not a big they're not our main concern. And then we have the the such like as pigeons, uh, but also probably rather paradoxically, you know, hoverfly, uh, which 
really shouldn't be a pest at all, but due to uh, customer demands in terms of uh, product, and we can't afford for the larvae uh, to, to be in finished product. So we, we run a fine balance um, with hoverfly and we, we leave them as long as we can. And, and nine times out of 10, we don't have to do anything. Uh, but if there is a, uh, a big, large sort of uh, infestation of them and, and the larvae, then we do have to treat them as a pest. But uh, it is, it's one of those things that we don't like to do, but custom demands sort of uh, demand, demand that we do. Uh, and uh, and I suppose the only one that's not on there is slugs uh, as well, which again, not uh, although it's a pest, uh, broccoli isn't such a big uh, big issue, but the cauliflower really takes a hammering from slugs, so we have to be fairly careful on those as well. Um, done next slide, please. So I suppose it moves on to what what do we what what do we do and how do we try and manage it? Well, the first First of all, um, I, before I get to that, I will go into the, the forecasting. We are big users of trapping. Um, we we have a large number of diamondback uh, traps from Kelsa up to Aberdeen um, and cabbage root fly as well. And then in the last couple of years, uh, we, we've been... Uh, using sweet uh sweet midge traps and and giving those to to rosemary to try and identify because there's no way i can i can try and do that on a sticky sticky pad in the field um so that that's the 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 trapping that we do and then we're we're quite heavily reliant on all the the forecasts uh which obviously hdb has been uh the the main source of in in recent years and there is obviously a concern um in, for the future as to how that is work as, as Rosemary alluded to uh, earlier on as well. That, uh, that is going to, if, if we, that disappears, that is going to give us some, some issues. Um, so as a, a large number of traps, it, it takes quite a lot of managing covering the area that we are uh, to, to keep on regular uh, counting and monitoring of the traps. Um, it is, a, it, takes one person of the team almost uh sort of a, a full day to um, day and a half sometimes to to get around everything to um to count and to monitor and, and and whatever we need to do but it is fairly essential um as well um uh, for for how we then manage things so if we go on to the next slide we've got um I've sort of just put the controls we obviously we we do use convention or chemistry to uh, to help us. Um, this is largely uh, down as drenches, um, of which Verimark is probably uh, the most common one. We we have we've been changing strategy over the last couple of years. Um, from you know as ever since we lost Durzban, which i think was it was a blessing really for the crop vitality and, and health as well but so since since we've lost that due to it was driven mainly from cost of Verimark, but actually again we're seeing some benefits from it we have a split strategy of early season cropping under the under the sheets we we do use tracer rather than Verimark. um Again, it's a bit of an insurance. Our, our early season crop is all done under uh, plastic or fleece. And then when we get into open crop, again, that is all 99% um, of that um, is then covered with um, nets that you see on the, the left of the screen. Um, and we, we need to do that predominantly against pigeons because uh, they can be a big issue up here, um, but due to the, the fineness, we, we do get some uh, control of other pests as well. So really, we we then only move on to, to Verimark as a drench for our sort of main uh, sort of six week summer period, which then, uh, which we tend, uh, pigeons are less of an issue. And uh, we, we do need sort of other uh, some form of control for things against uh, the aphid and diamondback, etc. 
from a cabbage root fly. So organically, we don't use anything because it is all, uh, although you can use uh, with a derogation tracer, um, we, we don't use anything uh, because it is, again, it's all covered, 100% of our, our organic area is, uh, is covered in uh, nets, insect mesh. Um, and although that adds a bit of cost to, to the operation, uh, we feel we get the value for, for money on it um, just from the pest control itself. Uh, so that's standard practice. And therefore, organically, really, the only pest we tend to have an issue with uh, is if a few, a few aphids get in underneath, uh, uh, underneath the nets uh, when we have to take off for hoeing um, and weed control. But again, you know, the last couple of years, I can only think of uh, two or three occasions uh, where we've we've actually had to go out with a uh, with a control for it. Um, so that's the before that, I suppose, and and it becoming more of an issue uh, with the sort of increase of sweet midge is our rotation. You know, we all as horticulture grows. No, well, as any grower knows, really, rotation is pretty key to to our to any growing strategy. But with the Swede midge, we have found that uh, it's not just the field rotation, but the geographic uh, location that we that has given us a, a lot of um, aid. So we had a big infestation. Uh, would it been two thousand and eighteen? Um, and due to uh, uh, sort of consequently, sort of conversations with Rosemary, learning a bit more about the pest because it hadn't been a, an issue uh, really previously. Um, knowing the, the weak flies, et cetera, we, we've moved away from that um, immediate vicinity from that particular farm. So the grower, uh, it, was a rent, uh, it was a rented block of land. Uh, and we were in a position that the our, our grower uh, was able to sort of park that for a couple of years um, and move away from it. And it has helped that area, that farmer that had the particular issue uh, hasn't had such a big issue in the last couple of years. We've got low levels sort of uh, with um, of it, but it's not not causing us anywhere near the same issue as we as we have. So. That geographic location is becoming quite important, which obviously puts other pressures on uh, as well. And it was alluded to in one of the questions earlier on, um, and it's probably this year might be quite telling as well. We have, I think we were relatively guilty uh, of, of using, let's say, a luxury level of nitrogen uh, for our crops. Uh, again, we all know that, you know, we can't, the one thing we can't afford is to have crop failure. So we, we were probably uh, using, you know, as I say, luxury levels of nitrogen to sort of make sure crops, um, uh, or to what we thought would encourage yield. We have um, in the last couple of years cut that down to, to where we think the nitrogen levels will be. And I think, again, it's hard to really quantify um, the, the benefit that we've had in terms of pest control, but certainly we have, haven't had quite the same pest issues, whether it be aphid, diamondback, um, or, or anything else really. So I think, I think that is, uh, I haven't got data for it, but it is certainly being part of the, uh, our, our overall control sort of strategy, I would say. Um, so on the last slide, really, uh, we got, it's the future. What what do we do? It's a very good question, and I don't have the answers. Uh, with HDB, with the forecasting, if if no other way is found to, for the forecasting to happen, that's going to make our lives uh, difficult for all sorts of crops, to be honest. Um, and I, I don't know where it will go because we, we are heavily reliant on it. What I do know is obviously mesh for organically um, is for us a, a no brainer. And whether it moves on to conventional, we'll see it. Uh, we, we do a fair bit of it, as I said earlier, but it, it's, uh, it does add cost to the whole operation and, uh, and 
costs and margins at the moment are under more pressure than they've been for a long time. So, or where, where it goes, whether it's viable to, to go broad acre with it, I'm not quite sure. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's me. That's an insight as to what we do up here. And if there's any questions. We've not had any questions through the chat, James, but I was just wondering on the net, when you're using crop covers and nets, um, yeah. do you see there's a significant temperature difference between the crop that's covered and the crop that's open? And does that have any quality effects? Um, th there, is a, there is a difference in temperature, um, definitely. Um, and we we use quite a wide range. Different growers have bought different nets at different times, so there's a there's quite a wide range of different uh, things being being used. Um, and yes, I think generally most most of our growers actually see the nets as are having a positive effect on on plant health and plant and crop. I think it obviously has to say it adds cost to to the operation and. If crop also is too uh, uh, too soft, uh, you do get a sort of a difficult deformation as the plant grows. It you know the the stem goes out to the side. If you're then using mechanical uh, methods for weed control, you do have a percentage of uh, loss as well. You know crop loss um, due due to that. So. Um, but the temperature, I think the crops do generally look look good underneath. The temperature difference with our sort of wider pigeon netting, as I sort of describe on bird netting, is is sort of fairly non-existent. What it does, but the other thing that help that really helps, or the the, the finer mesh mesh particularly, is um, you know on the east coast we have some pretty strong winds uh, quite often, and so. It, it does help from that side of things as well, uh, from protecting the crop. Um, the, typically, the nets in the main season. If we, if once we're in out of early season production, shall I say, you know, the nets are typically on only until the point that the plants are big enough to survive uh, pigeons. So, mm. sort of four, four, four weeks or so is, is generally enough. Okay, great. And we've had a couple of questions on the. Um, what what would be the life expectancy on the nets that you've that you're uh, that you're working um, with? I'd generally ten years to be honest, but uh, there's quite a few in in uh, within our grower base that will be going on for twenty. Um, so they 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 are a bit more patchwork. There's a few more cable ties in those holding things together, but uh, we do have some twenty year old nets still going. But generally, about ten years will be will be what they're written off over. Okay, and then we've also just got a question with the rise in uh, with the increase in crude oil price um, and the cost of um, the cost of plastic insect nets keeps rising. Mm -hmm. um, are you expect? Yeah, are you experiencing those significant cost increases on those nets? Yeah, I think uh, we we put in our order luckily uh, quite early for for this year's requirements quite early last year. Um, but it is going to be a, a big factor, and, and that's why I don't know whether they're a long-term, um, long-term solution really, or, or a broad acre solution, um, because uh, yeah, it, it, it's all up to individual growers uh, mm. really, and what they conventionally, as I say, they're mostly used for uh, for, the, for the pigeons, which are a nightmare up here. Um, but uh, but they do, I think, have these the 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 finer nets have these sort of other incidental controls, if you like. Mm. And uh, just in referring to the um, hoverfly larvae that you mentioned as well, a question from Stephanie, or more of a comment probably from Stephanie regarding, um, yeah, basically just um, emphasising the frustrations that we have as growers um with the consumer demand for insect free produce um mm. and particularly within salad crops as well um with a whole host of beneficials um hearing from technical um 
and you know and it comes through when you're speaking with technical staff with the retailers as well do the speakers or others think there is scope for a consumer campaign information campaign as regards learning to love beneficials in your vegetables i think there probably is i suppose it's a bit like uh there's a, a lot of these sort of things going on and it's trying to get consumer buy-in and, and mostly at the moment I think we're all guilty of it to one degree or another. We like convenience, don't we? Um, and having to take your lettuce home and wash it in case it all is uh, <laughs> quite a lot for some people. I think it's, um, you know, prep food. So I don't know. Yes, there probably is. Um, uh, and I think we should certainly be seeing some, you know, the, the retailers need, I think, should be engaging with that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw there was another quick question about bricks as well, whether we do, and, and the quick answer to that is yes, we do measure bricks, uh, probably um, not routinely enough uh, and, uh, to, to really give us beneficials in, in terms of pests, to be honest. Uh, we do use it, but it, it's in the field, so it's not probably not reliable enough for that. Great. Okay. Excellent. There's um, a couple more questions that have come through for Rosemary, but I'll um, mark those and we'll come to them um, after we've heard from Tim. So thanks for that, James. And uh, Tim, if I can uh, hand over to you, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm going to sort of give you sort of a bit of, little bit of background to us and how we got into um, working with automated traps and then sort of really explain how they work um, all the way through to sort of the sort of finer points of um, the extra sort of information you can get from them versus perhaps just looking at a, at a manual trap. So really giving a bit of a direction as to sort of where things might be moving to in the future. Um, certainly for certain pests, this is available now to use, but there's, there's a lot more work to be done. So we're, we're based in the Southeast of England. Um, we, we work throughout the UK and overseas as well, usually with, with British owned companies. And typically our core business is, is soil moisture monitoring. Um, we also work with, with sort of climate monitoring with weather stations and um, our systems range from the sort of the most basic of, of remote weather, electronic weather stations out in the field um, to a fully automated um, irrigation system with multiple sensors controlling irrigation. Um, behind our, our business, we've always been aware that farmers are sort of being tasked with more and more things to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis um, with more and more technology coming to them. And it's important to be able to simplify things as much as possible, I think, so that growers don't need to be experts in every little bit of technology that's coming onto the farm. So our view has always been to try and offer a service whereby from our side, we offer a complete um, service from start to finish of providing equipment, installing it, getting the data flowing through to, to the website and then offering a decision support service on top of that. So really the, the grower is left with information or an advisor is left with information to make a decision with. So we, we were speaking with um, one of our customers, probably going back to 2019, 2018, and it came up in conversation. We often like to put in front of them um, sort of, I don't know, related um, bits of technology and the trap view system was, was something that came up in conversation. It was an opportune moment because they were looking to, um, they are having some changes in their agronomy team and at that point, it then sort of fitted in nicely for silver wine monitoring um, in salad crops. So from that point onwards, we deployed a, a network of traps um, and it's been a sort of core part of their, their monitoring system and, and also forecasting as well. So if I could have the next slide, please, Tom. So the, the system we're talking about is actually, a, um, essentially, if, if, you, if we start from the, the field, you have a, an automated um, insect trap in the field, 
with a camera taking pictures of a, of a pest trap, of a sticky card with a, the um, insects on it. This then sends data up to, um, up to the cloud where it's processed um, using machine learning and the software to, to gain greater insight from the data. And then it's then displayed and made available through website and also mobile phone applications. Now, this, this setup of, of this sort of technology in the field, it, it's easy for people to think, oh, it means we don't need to go to the field anymore. But I think we, we find that actually having muddy boots on the ground is key to all of this. You, you have to get the basics right of being out walking the crops um, and using this really to gain greater insight into uh, it and then being able to manage your, your time better as well. If you've got um, this sort of system whereby you can see the latest data if you like coming in daily without the need to actually go and visit the field for, for um, checking traps, it does mean you don't need to be going constantly. But then when there is a need to go to the field, when there's a higher um, pressure on pests, you can then go and visit more frequently. So with, with this, there's, um, there's about 40 insects that can be automatically identified using the system currently. At the moment um, in the UK, I think it's predominantly being used for coddling moth um, in top fruit. Diamondback moth and silver wire would be the, the sort of most, most prevalent users um, currently. Can I have the next slide, slide please, Don? So in front of you here, there's sort of various different uh, traps available. As Rosemary mentioned earlier, there are sort of various different traps for, for different um, different insects. The, the one you see in the middle here is the, the one that we tend to use for the silver wire monitoring. Um, and the one on the top left here, the standard trap, is what would often be used for coddling moth in, in apples and pears. So if we, if we focus on this, this one in the, in the middle here, because you can sort of see more of the component parts, it's a um, self-powered system. There's a solar panel on there um, to power the system through the, through the season. We've got at the top here, we've got a, a sort of a funnel um, coming in the top and a, there'd be a pheromone placed in there to attract the insects in. They then go down and there'd be a sticky card um, in the bottom section of this trap which would, would catch the, the moths. And then in the top, top of this would be a high resolution camera. So this would be taking a, a picture once a day and uploading this to the cloud. There's a modem in there um, with a SIM card that is all transmitted over the mobile phone network, um, along with the GPS coordinates, which are picked up from this unit. So when it, when it lands um, up on the website, you can pick out exactly where it is, which is, is useful for identifying it in terms of when you've got multiple traps and seeing um, the pest pressure. Some people find it useful also when they happen to lose these things on farms and then they can track down where they are as well. Um, the, other, the other sensor which is on here next to the solar panel on this, on this picture is a temperature sensor. And this is a um, piece of data which is fed into the, into the system and is actually used as a sort of a parameter within the, um, the modeling in there, but looking at the life cycle of insects with temperature being a big driver of that. Now the next slide please, Don. So the image you see here is, is what you'd see when you, when you first log into the, the web portal to, to view this. Um, for, it's predominantly geared around moths, um, really is the, is the, the, main, the main insects which can be automatically identified. So the software itself will pick out and mark um, what's on the, on the sticky card. And when you, when you log in, it will show you how many new catches you have um, since previous day and the sort of cumulative over that, over that period. You will find there are occasions where you get, I know perhaps, two moths on top of each other and you, you can see it yourself, but the software has not been able to pick that up. So you can actually manually mark um, two or if something's been um, incorrectly marked on there, 
you can remove it. So you've actually got a, an accurate um, count on the, on the trap. Within, within here, we're also, you, you set it up. So you tell it what crop it is you're monitoring. Um, you have a start date for the monitoring period. Um, you can record when the pheromone was put into the trap. And there's reminders that are automated in there to help you um, just keep on top of things really. So you're not, you've not got an old pheromone in there which um, needs replacing without you knowing about it. And these images update once a day. Um, you can program when you want it to take, take the pictures, but once a day, it will take, take a picture, upload it, and then it's available for you to see either on the website or on your phone. The other thing which is quite useful in here is if you've got manual traps, you can actually enter those catches into here as well. So instead of it, it doesn't have to be, if you if you started out and you had one of these traps, you can actually enter locations and your catches for those manual traps into here as well. So you've got a, a bigger picture of what's going on as opposed to just purely looking at the, the I don't know, one or two automated traps you might have. Could I have the next, next slide please, Don? So if you do have multiple traps, when you're looking at that, that information, to try and get the most from it, um, you get to a point, I think, where the human brain struggles to interpret everything it needs to when you've got a lot of numbers going on and you've got different locations. So if you've, if you've got it in a sort of pictorial format on a, on a map, you can, you can see the different, um, the different traps and these will change um, according to the pest pressure. So if you had, um, higher pest pressure on some of these traps to the north, you'd see them changing color. So there'd be like a traffic light type system on here where you'd see it with a, showing the number of pests in those traps. So where you've got zero in all of these, you might have 20 or 50 being marked and it will be color, co um, color coded with a green, amber or red, depending on the number in there to give you an idea of where the pest pressure is. Going Forwards, I think there's there's interest from a lot of people to actually understand better insect movement. And as the networks of these traps develop around the world, I think that the hope is that there'll be the ability to share some of this information anomalized so you're not looking specifically at people's traps. Um, I think the, the exact do's and don'ts of all of this are to be ironed out. But I think the idea would be that in the future, if you're growing in the UK, you might be able to view um, information coming from I know, Spain, France, Netherlands to actually get a better idea of movement of, of specific pests. Can I have the next slide please, Don? So this, this next slide really sort of shows you um, on, the, on the brown bar graph on there, shows you the number of pests caught per day um, or increase per day of extra caught in the trap. And then the green line on there shows you the accumulation of that. So you can see the increase over time. This can be viewed um, on a trap by trap basis. So you can, you can understand what's going on. And it can also be reviewed historically as well. Um, so at the end of the season or, or many years afterwards, if you wanted to, to, to understand and review. Could I have the next slide please, Don? So the, the, next, the next part of this is looking at forecasting. Um, there's a simple part of this is a weather forecast, um, which, which feeds into, into here. And the sort of role of this is really looking at, I think some of it's used in the machine learning to understand in the, um, in the sort of forecasting element of this as to what the temperature is gonna be doing and how quickly um, pests might develop. Um, also, from a practical point of view, in as much as if you're looking to apply a control measure of some description, if it's blowing a gale and you've got heavy rain, the chances are you're not going to be able to do that at the time you want to. So actually having that information all in one place is quite useful just for helping you make, make decisions. Obviously, the, the traps are catching moths, which are the adults. Um, and they're not the, 
they're not going to be doing the damage to your crop. Um, so we need to be looking at the, the development of sort of when, when eggs are laid and the development of that. And now that, that's something which is being gradually built into here. So for, for silver Y um, and coddling moth, and I think there's a few others, um, other insects which this can be done for, there's actually a, a forecast in place. Can I have the next slide please, Don? So with this in, in mind, we've got on the, on the graph sort of behind here, we can see the different line colors on here are actually different development stages of, of the, um, the, the pest species we're looking at. And you can actually simulate uh, a spray. Um, I think this could, this could be used, I guess if you're using biologicals, I'm sure in some way you could, you could also adapt it to, to use that and understand with, with experience um, what, what effect it, it would have. But you could put in a date when you intend to apply a protection method. Um, you can put, if, you, if we're talking about a spray, you could take the number of days that spray should be effective for, the efficiency of it, and the effective, effective development stages that it would target. If you then click on the run simulation option on here, it will then run through and give you an indication of what, what effect that should have. If I could have the next slide please, Tom. So if we look on, on this graph here, you can see the shaded area. If you were to apply um, the proposed application on the 19th of, of October, um, it would have a 94% um, efficiency. You can see the weather forecast down the bottom of this. And this gives you an idea of really, as I said earlier, if, if you had um, adverse weather conditions that were gonna mean you weren't able to apply that protection method at, at that certain point, it would then mean you could actually look at it and think, well, actually we're gonna to have to delay this by a week because the weather's not gonna let us do it. Um, and then you can then look at it and see, see what control level you may have. Now, I think this is um, something which is being developed constantly. And I think over time will become, will become um, more and more accurate really. I think the more, the more data that there is um, collected and fed back into the system. But it's certainly, a, I think, a useful tool for trying to understand what's going on and what, a, what, what effect you might have. The other thing you might be able to do with this is to, um, to perhaps choose different products as well, because it might be you don't need such a high um, efficiency of control. So um, it does, does mean you can play around with, with strategies and, and, and look for different options. Could I have the, the next slide, please, Don? That, that really sort of, sort of rounds up um, what I was going to talk to you about with, with all this. I mean, there's, there's numerous benefits for all this. I think we've, we've got, and certainly in the UK, we've got big labour shortages at the moment. And having lots of people travelling around um, looking at traps, if there's other jobs they're doing at the same time, it's not such a big issue, but if that's their main focus, it certainly saves, saves them time. Um, it means you can also target that labor better. So if you know there's a high pest pressure, um, you can be looking at, looking at that better. The other thing I'm, I think using the, the overviews, if, you've got, if you know you've got certain geographic locations with higher pest pressure, it might be um, when you're looking at the, um, the crop coming in from harvest, but maybe um, the sort of quality control team can focus more on certain produce coming from certain areas because you know you've, you've got had a greater issue in those those spots. Um, but I think I think the I know a, a big big benefit from from any form of monitoring is the fact you've got those those records there. The easier they are to interpret and understand, you can look back and and, and make plans um, going forward. And I think. A, with with remote monitoring, the beauty of it is you can you can do it from anywhere. So, although lots of people might not admit it, I think if they are on holiday, it's quite nice to be able to keep track of what's going on um, on the farm while they're away. And and also just happen if not many people are, are office based constantly, so being able to actually access information on the move is is very useful. I think I'm that that covers off. Um, 
everything I was looking sort of cover there. So yeah, um, perhaps we could yeah look to see if there's there's any questions and and I'll I'll do my best to to sort of follow up. That's great. Thanks a lot, Tim. Um, that was um, excellent. Really interesting. Um, just one question that we've had, which is not really a, a question that's just come through for you, is um, could you? Is it possible for you to just post your contact details in the uh, Zoom chat for um, anybody that's interested in um, getting to know a bit more about trap view and soil moisture sense? Uh, that would be great. So um, a few other questions that have come up. Um, James, this is probably one for you. Um, do you have experience with crop resistant varieties um, or uh, Rosemary, feel free to chip in as well. And do they work? <laughs> from a pest point of view, um, not really. From a disease point of view, yes, we're, we use quite a few of them um, for, from a disease point of view, but from a pest point of view, uh, the straight answer is, is no, we don't, no experience anyway. Okay. I don't know if Rosemary, you've got anything to add to that, but. Uh, yeah, I, th I mean, I think the one of the reasons why is because there aren't that many resistant, pest resistant varieties available in, in at least in, in vegetable production. Um, and I guess the, be the best example is um, resistance in, in lettuce to the current lettuce aphid, um, which is complete resistance and, and has been bred into a lot of varieties. Um, but then there's an issue with, because it's such effective resistance, it's actually selected for populations of current lettuce aphid can, that can overcome that resistance. So, so if you do deploy resistance, and I think that's, that's true also of, of um, downy mildew resistance in lettuce, that if you do deploy effective resistance in varieties, it ha actually has to be managed um, and probably on a landscape scale to, mm. to actually maintain yeah. resistance. Um, and, and actually we've just had, um, he's just submitted his PhD, um, but we've had a, a PhD student jointly with um, Rothamsted as part of the Waitrose um, programme of PhDs. And he's been looking at the biology of current lettuce aphid and looking at trying to understand you know what what populations of current lettuce are, aphid are doing and 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 sort of looking at at you know the resistance and the breakdown of resistance and he's produced some quite interesting stuff um and he'd be talking at the uh the brassica and salad conference leafy salad conference in a couple of weeks time great um gary has asked Rosemary, can you comment on the success of carrot fly resistant cultivars and are they used by growers? Okay, good, good question. Um, so yes, it follows on from the resistance. So the resistance that is available commercially at the moment to carrot fly is, is what we call partial resistance. And so it, 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 if you like, reduces the carrot's susceptibility to carrot fly, but it can still um, suffer damage. Um, and there are two varieties on the market that were developed years ago um, after a, a good chunk of research by um, a colleague of mine, Bob Ellis, and they are resistor fly and fly away and, and they are available to, to gardeners. But I don't think I don't think we've got any commercial carrot growers on here, but but they're not they're not sort of suitable for commercial production for other other reasons um, and so you know that's another thing about resistance that you you know when you breed in resistance you also have to maintain the other characteristics that um, that growers and ultimately retailers and consumers need but but just as a quick add-on there has been a, a, a chunk of research going on on, on carrot fly resistance um, which looks very promising a seed company and uh, or at least one seed company and but it takes a long time for the varieties to actually get out into commerce so it's it's probably a, a you know a 13 14 year project so hopefully some will appear at some point i think we see um the same uh, yeah we're, we're seeing the same with potato variety uh, blight resistant potato varieties as well as sort of in kind of working with um seed producers to sort of gear up um 
varieties to come on stream as, as we see chemistry drop off um, and making sure that yeah we're linking up all of the supply chain as well from sort of growers to seed producers and to retailers as well to make sure that you know we're producing a product that people want to buy so yeah, yeah. um just um a question i had tim on the um for when we were when you were talking about the um simulation um when you if you're going to put a control in place, a control application in place. So if, if, if a grower had the system and they were, um, I'm, I'm assuming there's an option to put the, app, the actual application in and then see what the effect was on the pest, on the control of the pest, is there? And whether that's then feeds back into the modeling that Trapview were doing. Yeah, so I, I think you, you, you can put in um, the exact details of, of what we've done. Um, so you can run, run your simulations. Um, you can then, yeah, you can then put in actual products and have that full record in there mm -hmm. against, um, it, and then you'd, you'd start another sort of monitoring period, I think, beyond that, where you're then looking to see what the catches are um, again after there. So it's sort of a continual loop in there, I think, of, of trying to learn from it. Yeah. I guess it's ascertaining, I guess, exactly what the controls been is the is the tricky part, I guess, isn't it? I mean, you can you can observe, but actually putting a number on it's a, a difficult thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there was another question for you, Rosemary, that came up earlier on in the um, pest forecast that that you'll run the models that that have been run uh, do they cross-reference weather patterns against insect insect activity such as the effect of warmer wetter winters um so so most of the pest forecasts i think that are available in yeah in the uk and around the world actually use weather to to run them um and they'll depending on on what the pest is and what the impacts of weather are on it different sort of components of weather will be used in those in those forecasts um so yeah in some of the forecasts then winter weather is important so for example the forecast that that Rothamsted produce for for um cabbage aphid peach potato aphid and potato aphid that is basically um the influence of winter weather um but others are about just how fast insects are developing in, in certain parts of the year um, and I think as Tim said they they develop faster when it's when it's warmer in general. Great thank you um, and something that was touched on earlier in one of the chats James was just on light levels when using crop covers so we're assuming that there is a reduction in light levels to the crop and what sort of effect that would have on yeah, the no, there development. Is. Yeah, there is. Um, obviously, this part of the world, we're quite lucky and we have the sort of good light levels generally and longer days during the summer. Um, and I have to say, an early season um, organic production especially, uh, but it, it, is a, it is an issue. We do have a lower, we, we therefore grow a lower density under the crop covers to try and compensate for that. Um, and we also, for our very early season sort of production, we make sure we use sort of new plastic um, rather than reused uh, plastic because it is a clearing and it does allow more light in. Um, but by the time we get into sort of uh, the more of the main main cropping season, mid season, um, due to the the day length up here and the light availability, um, but it tends not to be an issue and we can put our um, crop densities back to, to where they would be uh, in, in the conventional sort of outdoor production. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one question that's just come through is, um, what kind of monitor, probably for you Rosemary, is what kind of monitoring can be done for pests in protected structures like spider mite or, wine or vine weevil? Um, again, yeah, there are, you know, there are different approaches available for, for, for monitoring them. I mean, if, if whoever asked the question wants to email me, um, I can probably supply more, more details. Um, within the, this Smart Protect project that I mentioned, the thematic network, um, we are 
um i mean we were sort of talking about about monitoring outdoors both tim and i but but there are also technologies in there um for monitoring within protective crops as well um some quite interesting ones um and what we're hoping to do in the smart protect project this year is is try out um some of these these um different technologies in different parts of 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 europe um and and sort of exchange the the information and have some workshops webinars whatever about about them great and do you think we'll see um so do you see more kind of trapping for control more in a protected environment than we do in an open crop and open crop trapping is more as regards of monitoring to enable more targeted control methods yeah i think i mean i think there's more potential in a in a protected crop just because the it's a confined system um and so you're not continually getting influxes of of new pests at least hopefully you're not getting influxes so i think you can probably have um more more impact um there, again there is with we've identified within this smart protect project a really interesting uh, bit of kit that is a a drone that 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 you can fly in at the moment they're do, using it in greenhouses and it, it tracks it can only deal with large insects like moth at the moment it tracks the insect and then it annihilates it there's a really a nice video showing how it how it works and uh, so i'm sure i mean i'm sure you know the stuff is really moving on at the moment um really interesting that's great um and I see, uh, thanks for that, Gary. I think you've had a comment for Claire on spider mites. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, if there is, if there are any more questions or anybody that would like to um, raise a question in person, then uh, here's your opportunity to do so. If you uh, just raise your virtual hand with the, uh, with the wavy hand icon, that would be great. Um, we've got around about five minutes left, so um, that just gives us enough time to ask any questions um, that we've got um, outstanding. Um, and to give a quick roundup, I think Rosemary, if, oh, you've just put your um, email in the chat, so that's brilliant. I know earlier there was a, a question about sort of reductions in in sprays through using monitoring, and um, it's not. I mean, it's, they're not not trials that we've been involved with directly, but ones I've sort of been made aware of. Um, and I know there's there's sort of odd examples in in Spain with with lettuce crops where a single application has been saved on a on a crop. Um, quite quite frequently, I think, with looking to control silver Y. And I think coddling moth is probably one of the more mature sort of monitoring systems, um, certainly with the automated trapping. And I know between sort of a, a standard, um, I suppose, sort of time-based um, spray regime on those versus actually using, using the traps for it. I know that they've seen, a, I think, a... I think there was a crop that was independently monitored on there where they'd seen sort of five to six standard sprays being used on a crop of apples and two being used um, with, with monitoring. I think the, the tricky thing with any of this, and what we see in, the, in moisture monitoring as well, it, it depends on the level you're starting at with the grower, doesn't it? Because the, the better you are at growing to begin with, you're going to have smaller savings. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely, I think yeah, that's a good point, and that those those necessary small small savings aren't sort of small when you equate it to the scale that some you know that some growers are operating, or even at a smaller. I mean, it's all relative, but with increased cost, um, you know, and challenges through the supply chain, they're um, they're not they're not so small, so they're always worth um, they're always worth going after. And I think we're probably at, as growers now we're at the stages of cha of chasing those one two three percent three percent improvements rather than um you know the, there's no silver bullet out there for us anymore i think we've exhausted all of those so yeah absolutely i agree as you said earlier tim as well it's, it, the monitoring isn't a replacement for walking the field 
Um, so we we use some monitoring uh, on our traps, etc., to just add, as well as what we see in the field to gauge whether we actually need to to spray or not. Um, so you know where, where we have traps, it, it certainly helps. Um, to and I think we have reduced our insecticide sprays on the back of it, definitely. That's it. Just another question, Tim, um, for any sort of grower groups that are out there or growers that are looking to work collaboratively. Um, is the trap view system suitable for, um, say, a grower group or a group of growers wanting to work collaboratively to, so they can access each other's traps and not necessarily their own, so they can get a better idea of what's happening over a larger geographical area? No, it certainly is. I think, I mean, if, if you had a essentially you could have a, a single login um, which would then share I know if you if you had 10, 10 traps or five traps whatever the number is that you you shared between a group of growers mm -hmm. they could all be all be on the the single account for people to log into and you could you could then see that sort of um, the map view and you could see the pest pressure across it so it could be yeah it could be a group of growers over a considerable area even um, which would give you the insight into into movement within that um that that group of growers perfect and then just one very last um question from claire on uh, soil moisture for pests that live under the soil like leather jackets or root flies do you have any uh comments on that rosemary yeah so on monitoring in fact i, I put in one ah, you've put in a link. i put That's in there's, um, there's a paper that was a project i was involved in a european project and we produced a paper about decision support for root feeding flies which is monitoring and and forecasting um and um yeah leather leather jackets i think again i think there is some information uh available somewhere again i i can hunt it out if anybody wants it and to to go back to the vine weevil i've just been um ed an editor for a journal called insects and actually there's a vine weevil paper about to come out as well about about trapping so yeah Perfect. That's great. Well, I'd just like to um, take the take this opportunity to thank the panel very much. Um, so thanks, Rosemary, Tim and James for joining us this morning. I hope um, all of you that have joined us as well have found this really useful. Um, I think there's been some really good, good, interesting content um, and wide discussion that we've had. What I will, um, what I will really sort of ask you to do as delegates is to look at the DEFRA consultation that Rosemary has posted a link to as regards sort of where we are with funding for the um, for these pest forecasts and you know to support the ongoing work with the changes within the AHDB um, so if you could please have a look at that we'd really appreciate it if you'd like to continue any further discussions then we can move it over onto the WAVER platform um, which um, is of which ORFC are running um, and also you'll be able to see all the speakers biographies there so there should be contact details for them as well so again thank you very much um, all for joining us this morning and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you.